It is dawn on the African savanna. Two of its giants, one a bovine, the other a predator, are on a collision course. Amber eyes watch the herd. Unknown, silently, the tawny hunters slip through the brown grass into position. A single bull is isolated. One wrong move and the hunter can become the hunted. It will be a contest between speed and strength, cunning and hunger, horn and claw. It is a battle for the survival on the savanna. One of Africa's most successful herbivores is a bovine, the Cape or African buffalo. Often congregating into herds of several thousand, they are literally Africa's wild cattle. It is a matriarchal system, with an experienced cow leading the herd. Their strength is legendary. Bulls weighing 625 kilograms and a cow 530 kilograms. Sharing the savanna grasslands and woodlands with a buffalo is Africa's largest predator, the lion. They too are gregarious, congregating into prides. It may be difficult to understand why lions would risk injury or even death hunting buffalo when there's an abundance of smaller and safer prey. Perhaps the answer is that although the risks are high, so are the rewards. Nearly a ton of meat can keep a large pride of lions fed for several weeks. One such pride in Kenya's Masai Mara have become specialist buffalo hunters. The techniques have been passed down the generations. Today, as the lions move in on the herd, one vital ingredient is missing in the lion's assault. There are no mature males. At 200 kilograms, only the males have the strength to capture and kill a bull buffalo. An old bull breaks from the herd, a potentially fatal maneuver. However, he's an experienced adversary and heads into marshy ground where the lions are less effective. Another bull is separated, but the lionesses do not have the strength to pull him down. In the confusion, a cow and a calf have been isolated. Now, a dangerous ancient game of life and death unfolds, with the odds heavily stacked in the lion's favor. Some lions will harass the cow from the front, while others will attempt to take the calf from the rear. The cow's best form of defense is attack, but at no time must she allow herself to be separated from the calf. has a trump card to play. By bellowing her distress, she alerts the herd bulls, who respond immediately, 
allowing the cow and calf time to rejoin the herd. The pride has spent enormous energy on this hunt. The risks have been high and the rewards negligible. They retire to wait for their most important ally, darkness. An entourage of egrets and herons gratefully accept the insects disturbed from the grass by the moving herd. A large herd of buffalo has an enormous impact on the habitat. They are bulk grazers, eating the long, coarse grass that no other animals are able to do. Two hundred and fifty mouths and a thousand hooves trample the tall grass, creating ideal conditions for the short grass feeders, like the wildebeest. The dung deposited by the passing herd returns valuable minerals and phosphates to the soil, creating a symbiotic relationship. The land feeds the buffalo and the buffalo dung rejuvenates the land. A female leopard in estrus rolls in the fresh dung. Perhaps like a lady with perfume, this will make her more desirable to the male. Scent from the dung attracts dung beetles, which fly in from kilometers around. The male rolls the dung into a ball in which the female will lay her eggs. This provides the first nutrition for the larvae when they hatch. The lion's ally, darkness, has arrived. They prepare to renew their attack. Silently, like shadowy ghosts, the lions infiltrate the unsuspecting herd. Constantly vigilant, the lead cow picks up the scent of the lions. In the confusion, the young males have captured a bull. They may lack the strength or weight to bring him down, but they have the numbers. With time and a supreme cooperative effort, they finally subdue him. Several Ihina have heard the bull bellowing. It'll be a long time before they gain access to the kill.
By morning, the lions are satiated. One sub-adult stays to guard the remains. The advantage now shifts to the hyenas. Superior in numbers, several harass from the front, while others make darting runs from behind. Vultures gather quickly. They have a vested interest in the hyenas gaining the carcass. The hyenas will tolerate them, but the lions will not. <laughs> Ironically, descending vultures also alert the resting lions. Several return to the kill. The numbers are now even. The hyena continue their harassing tactics. It is a dangerous, deadly game. The powerful neck and shoulders of the spotted hyena are perfectly designed to run, grip, tear and carry off meat at high speed. Back at the den site, the hyena cubs benefit from bones brought back by the adults. It is April, and the cows over five years old are coming into estrus. High-ranking males compete to cover the receptive females. There is something primeval about two powerful animals competing for dominance. Contests can result in injury and even death. However, the right to inject one's genes into the next generation negates the risks of combat. Victorious, the bull returns to cover the cows. By sampling the urine through the organ of Jacobson, located in the roof of his mouth, the bull can precisely determine when the cow can be mounted. Old bulls, low in the hierarchy and long past mating, watch the proceedings. Their weather-beaten faces tell a history of battles won and lost, when they too fought for dominance. Several of the pride's lionesses have also come into estrus. The dominant males respond immediately in a carefully synchronized mating system. <laughs> the
The males are brothers, so each is injecting 50% of his brother's genes during mating. As the seasons change, rain rejuvenates the grass, creating optimum grazing. Eleven months after mating, the cows begin to calve. In preparation for the birth, the cow separates from the herd. Another cow will often stand guard to protect the cow in labor. Unseen, the first calf slips into the tall grass. A second calf is born after sunset. Weighing 40 kilograms, it can walk within 10 minutes and by morning, the cow is able to rejoin the herd with her new calf. After 110 days, the lionesses produce four cubs each. Of these, only one third will reach maturity. The calves suckle from between the mother's hind legs, unlike cattle that suckle from the side. Buffalo only produce one calf every 15 months. Therefore, they have a much higher investment than the lions that can afford to lose some of their cubs. For several weeks, the lionesses keep their cubs separate from the pride, while the buffalo have already integrated their offspring into the safety of the herd. Like all youngsters, lion cubs and buffalo calves initiate play whenever possible. Play is essential in developing speed, strength and coordination, essential for survival of both predator and prey. In an ancient ritualized journey, the wildebeest follow the life-giving rains back to Serengeti. They too will give birth, but in a much shorter period of synchronicity. Felt fires consume the remaining grazing left by the departing wildebeest. The water in the grasslands has dried up. The time of plenty has ended. The never-ending search for new grass triggers the movement of the herd and where the buffalo go, the pride follows. Years of accumulated knowledge and experience have taught the herd cow that in the woodlands nutritious shade grasses will be found and the water holes still have water.
The success of the buffalo is their ability to feed off tall fibrous grasses, unpalatable to other grazing species. In this way, the buffalo occupy a niche exclusive to themselves, a key ingredient to their survival. An entourage of red-billed oxpeckers move with a herd, grooming them of parasites. They also provide an early warning system. A prehensile tongue gathers the grass rapidly, powerful grinding teeth cut it, and a four-compartmented stomach allows them to lie down to rest while the food is regurgitated, chewed, and then swallowed. The lions know that as temperatures rise, the buffalo will move to the water holes. As the adults move towards the cool water, a young calf is left unattended. The tawny hunters spot the opportunity and move into position. The mud reduces heat stress and provides a protective layer against tsetse and other flies. The attack triggers a stampede, but in the confusion the calf is caught, but not killed. Its distress call brings its mother instantly to its aid. Bulls and cows viciously counter-attack the lions. Fortunately for the lions, trees are at hand. It is only their ability to climb which saves them from certain death. As long as the branches hold their weight, they will be safe. The cow stands over her stricken calf, urging her to follow her. However, the calf has been too badly injured in the initial attack. Gradually, the cow and the herd accept the inevitable and move off. Returning to ground, the lions claim their kill. This time, the buffalo were not the only losers. The dominant lioness and main hunter for the pride has broken her foreleg. 
Her sister has been gored in the right thigh. It is now that the pride system becomes obvious. Other lions can hunt and provide food while the injured lionesses recover. In the case of the dominant lioness, recovery is unlikely. The dominant males have returned from patrolling their territory. Now the pride have three extra mouths to feed, but their chances of pulling down a large buffalo are greatly increased. Strangely, the pride over time catch more male buffalo than females. Perhaps this is because they tend to move on the periphery of the herd, while the cows and calves are nearer the center and hence more protected. Once again, the lions wait for darkness to make their attack. It is a cooperative effort between the males and the females. A large bull is caught, but even with the added strength of the male lions, they are unable to bring him down. In the confusion, he manages to escape, although badly mauled. The next morning, the wounded bull separates from the herd. He seeks a water hole where water and mud can protect his open wounds. The male lions follow. They know that by nightfall, the bull will be weaker and their chances of pulling him down greater. Patiently, they wait in the shade near the water hole. Oxpeckers clean the maggots infecting the wounds. As the heat intensifies, the great bull weakens. As night falls, the males call the pride to assemble. They will need all the unified strength to pull the bull down. The male lions assess the situation cautiously. There is nothing more dangerous in the African bush than a wounded buffalo. They send a lioness to test him out. The bull easily shrugs her off. The male launches his full 200 kilogram body onto the back of the bull. Pulling his legs clear off the ground, he gives the bull the full effect of his weight. Great energy has been expended during the hunt, but the return is a ton of meat for the pride to gorge on.
After quenching their thirst, the dominant males proclaim their territory to all those who would challenge them. is in the grip of the dry season. Water holes are rapidly drying and turning to mud. The buffalo must rely on body fat accumulated during the good months. Now they show their great versatility. As the nutrition in the grass wanes, they switch their diet to leaves and herbs to sustain themselves. Driven by thirst, the herd thunders towards the river. One of the young pride females has given birth to a single cub. Unsynchronized with the other cubs and not worth raising alone, the female abandons it to die of starvation. When the buffalo herd comes across the dead cub, the response is fascinating. The scent evokes a deep-seated hatred in the bulls, and the males and females attack it. When the attack creates no response, they gather around, curiously sniffing and even licking the dead cub. The matriarch leads the herd across the river. The river is a giver of life, but it can also be a place of death.
Some animals are lagging behind. In a flanking cooperative attack, the lionesses cut the stragglers off. they squeeze them between the bank and the water. In the confusion, one adult cow stumbles and instantly the hunters isolate her from the main herd. In an interesting anti-predator tactic, she runs for the river, attempting to swim to freedom. Unfortunately for her, Several large crocodiles have been watching the hunt with interest. They move into position to block her escape route. The cow is effectively caught between two of Africa's most powerful predators. For 12 hours, the cow remains trapped in this fatal dilemma. Eight hungry lions on land and half a dozen large crocodiles in the water. It has become a waiting game. Will it be the lions, or will it be the crocs that claim the kill? She bellows her distress, but the herd is too far to respond. The cow fights on. She has been in and out of the water no less than 14 times. Another factor is entering the equation. Can the buffalo cow slip away under the cover of darkness? Seemingly careless of the drama being played out on the riverbank, night falls like a blanket over the river. Finally, confused and exhausted, the brave cow makes an attempt to escape.
spotted hyena and crocodiles wait patiently for a turn at the carcass. By morning, the kill has been pulled back and forth by lion, hyena and crocodile. If the hungry crocs can get it into the water, it will be exclusively theirs. Finally, 48 hours later, the crocs that played such a decisive role in the hunt have managed to drag the prize into the murky waters. Millions of buffalo once roamed the savannas and woodlands of Africa. Today, they are confined to the national parks and game reserves. Buffalo inhabit the higher rainfall areas in Africa. It is these areas that humans require for agriculture. Africa's human population is approaching one billion people. Slash and burn of natural habitats move buffalo out and people in. Backed by World Bank loans, many of the African countries have destroyed the buffalo to replace it with cattle. The ability of buffalo to transmit contagious diseases to cattle is seen as the greatest threat to the cattle industry. Perhaps Botswana best typifies the war against buffalo. In its desire to promote beef, some 1,900 miles of veterinary wire fences have been erected through some of the finest wilderness areas in Africa. In an effort to separate wildlife from cattle, this deadly grid of fences placed across traditional migratory routes has caused some of the greatest destruction of wildlife ever seen on the African continent.
Once the cattle have replaced the buffalo, artificial water points must be provided for the cattle. The surrounding areas are quickly trampled and sheet and trench erosion spread like a cancer. What was once productive grassland under wildlife has become a wasteland under cattle. It is called desertification, an ugly word for a destructive process. Now, nature is beginning to fight back. In the UK, an infection called mad cow disease broke out after cattle were fed a concoction of feed from the carcasses of sheep. To prevent the disease from spreading, the British government was forced to slaughter and incinerate 10 million head of cattle at a cost of hundreds of millions of pounds. People died from eating the infected meat. As information becomes available, more and more informed people are for health, ethical and ecological reasons choosing not to eat beef. Conservationists have learnt to breed disease-free buffalo in captive conditions for release back into the wild. More and more game ranchers are replacing cattle with buffalo because they are indigenous and not destructive to the landscape. African governments are realizing that tourists will not pay to see a cow eking out an existence in a bankrupt environment, but they will pay to see herds of buffalo, wild and free, roaming the savannah grasslands. Imagine a world where the vast degraded areas devastated by cattle are restored to their natural state. The rainforests, the lungs of the world, would have a reprieve from the ubiquitous hamburger markets. The buffalo could return to large parts of the prairies of North America. And these two giants, the buffalo and the lion, would continue their titanic struggles as they survive on the African savannas.